Hello and welcome to GameSag. Let's check out some games that need more love. Now, maybe you've heard of some of these titles and maybe you haven't. These aren't necessarily unknown games. It's just that they don't get appreciated as much as I feel that they should. And since they aren't celebrated as much as I think they should be, there is the possibility that a lot of people never thought to play them. And I think that everyone should play these games. Anyway, first up is a Genesis game that came out in the latter half of his life. We start out with Beyond Oasis for the Genesis from Ancient, the same people who brought us Streets of Rage 2 and 3. This one is called Story of Thor Elsewhere. This one's an overhead adventure game that bears a passing resemblance to many of the Zelda titles. You play as Prince Ali, and yes, the Aladdin soundtrack is now stuck in my head too. Anyway, during the opening cutscene, you find a gold armlet. This will let you summon certain elemental spirits after you find them. There's a guy with a silver armlet out there causing some trouble, and you need to put him in his place. The control will take a small amount of time to become comfortable with, but once you do, it's smooth sailing. You can jump, attack, and summon your elemental powers once you acquire them. You tap C to jump and hold it to crouch. You tap B to stab, but you can also hold it and do motions with the D-pad for bigger and stronger attacks. The start button brings up your menu. Here you have items and you can use them to refill your health and magic meters, check your status, switch your weapons, or look at a map and see where you need to go next. Once you have them, you summon the elemental spirits with the A button. If it hits a water object, you get the water spirit. If it hits a fiery object, you get the fire spirit, and so on. Using the elementals can be a bit weird sometimes as they can seem kind of dumb, but you'll definitely need them to get past certain obstacles. Don't worry, you'll get the hang of it soon enough. The game has a large overworld and several dungeon type areas to make your way through. Like the Zelda games, the dungeons occasionally have small puzzles to figure out. Sometimes you might just need to defeat all of the enemies to open a door, other times you'll need to get a key or whatnot. You don't gain any experience or money in this game, but you can level up a little bit by collecting these hearts. These will slightly increase your stats. The game might seem slow to some, but honestly it's kind of relaxing. You go at your own pace, which is nice, and you can save at almost any time on the overworld just as long as you're not being attacked by enemies. The graphics remind me of an animated movie, with the sprites looking like cells from a cartoon. The backgrounds are also very nice, with many areas giving a hand-drawn feel. The visuals only update at 30 frames per second, which is not ideal, but fortunately this isn't a fast-paced action game. If that's a deal breaker for you, well, then I pity you because you're missing out on a great game. The sound and music was done by Yuzo Koshiro, and it was definitely a departure compared to what we were used to from him at the time. The music here is a lot more ambient, not stuff you usually hear coming from the Genesis. It becomes louder and more intense when needed, and quiet and lighter at other times. There's also some stereo panning of some of the environmental sound effects. This isn't the longest game in the world, and it'll take you about six or so hours to finish. But honestly, it's six hours worth spending. Of course, if you want to go around everywhere and grab everything, it might take you closer to 10. This game definitely does not get enough love. And while I'm here, don't forget about the prequel on the Saturn called Legend of Oasis. It's very similar, but upgraded in every area, just like you'd expect. It's a little longer than Beyond Oasis, since the dungeons here are much larger and more complex. Sadly, this one gets even less love than Beyond Oasis, simply because it's on the Saturn. Oh yeah, and it was a 2D game in a time where 2D games weren't very appreciated. I like the graphic improvements and everything, and now the game runs at 60 frames per second. The music is even more abstract this time around. I'll let you decide if that's a good thing. But the controls feature some new shortcuts which help out a lot. If you can play either one or both of these games, you won't be sorry. Here's Skyblazer on the Super NES from Sony ImageSoft. 
This is an action platformer that I haven't seen mentioned often. It can be pretty tough in certain areas, and it's probably been responsible for a tossed controller or two in its time. Anyway, the story doesn't much matter here, and I can't even remember if there was one. Like I said, it makes no difference at all. You can jump and attack with a punch. The X button is used for your special attack. You can also cling to most vertical surfaces and climb up and down, similar to Ninja Gaiden. You have a life meter which is green, and the reddish-brown meter is for your special attacks. You usually gain special attacks after completing different areas. Your special attacks can be anything from tossing an energy wave, helping you dash across the entire screen, restoring your life, or even giving you the ability to fly for a bit. Of course, using these eats up a lot of your meter. Fortunately, you can grab things to restore it, as well as icons to restore your life, as well as things for points to help you gain more lives. You don't have many segments on your life meter, and touching an enemy can take off more than one point. Overall, the control can feel a touch slippery, but you can adjust to it after a while. But if it's not quite slippery enough for you, don't worry, there is a nice level. There's a password feature, which basically means you have unlimited continues, and you'll probably need each and every one of those unlimited continues. There are plenty of challenges here, like these disappearing and reappearing blocks. I hate this crap, I think it's lazy design, but there are people out there who absolutely love this. It seems tough, but come on, you can do it. Or this part, where the wall keeps closing in on you. It's tougher than it looks, as sometimes getting onto the damn ledge can be tricky enough. The game is full of stuff like this, which will not only drive you nuts, but it also makes it kind of endearing in a way. There are also some inventive boss fights like this one, where you need to make it through the opening as he turns around or you're done for. The turning gets faster and faster as you fight. I really enjoyed this one. I didn't enjoy this stage very much, though. You need to use the currents to guide you, and the same developer would use this idea much more effectively on Punky Skunk for the PlayStation. The graphics are excellent and full of color. In fact, they look a little bit like Hook on the same system, but hey, it was developed by the same people. This is their second game, which came right after Hook. There is some Mode 7 here, but it looks kind of twitchy, mainly because your character is unable to stop sliding in the direction that you push. The music and sound quality is also very good here, though the melodies themselves are rather unmemorable. If you want a challenge, be sure to give this one a try. There's a lot here to keep you entertained, if you're up to the task. Well, are you? A lot of times games will fly under my radar because, you know, nobody talks about them very much. In fact, this next game was mentioned in the comments of the last Overlooked Games episode. And you know what? I tried it out and it's really good. I like it a lot. I didn't want to stop playing. What game is it? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. Well, actually, yes, I am. Here you go. This is Dragon Valor on the PlayStation from Namco. This is technically the third game in Namco's Dragon Buster franchise, and it comes on two discs. This one presents itself as a hack-and-slash 3D action game, but it's not simple arcade style like Golden Axe. There's a lot more to this one. The action is somewhat similar to other hack-and-slash games, though. You attack with your sword and defeat enemies. There are different moves you can do, like an upper or lower thrust attack, dash attacks, and what have you. You can even double jump. There is a bit of lag in the controls that you will have to get accustomed to, but it's not huge. There's also magic that you can equip once you get it. This can strengthen your attack, plant mines, make you invisible, or even heal you, among other things. You can equip whichever one you'd like at any time in your status or even your status screen. You can collect money as well as items to sell. Also, there are plenty of items to refill your life and magic meters. The game is divided into chapters. In chapter one, you encounter your village on fire and your sister dies. You learn that it was done by a dragon named Dragon. Yeah. You get the special dragon defeating sword and make it your life's goal to defeat the dragon, which you do in a few minutes. But after he dies, it spawns out a smaller dragon who flies away. You spend five years looking for it. Along the way, you'll have numerous story scenes which play out. 
These are kind of slow, but you can skip them if you really want to by pressing start. I kind of recommend that you don't though. Between each stage, there's a map screen where you can choose your path. You can also find the shops here. The shop experience kind of sucks because you can only buy or sell, not both. And you have to wait for the shopkeeper to get to the item you want before you can buy it. It's very slow and probably the worst aspect of the game, but you can make it through. The stages themselves have you defeating a lot of different foes, including these giant enemy crabs. What you want to do here is attack their weak points for massive damage. There's even a bit of puzzle solving that you'll have to do in this one. Sometimes you'll even have a choice to make during gameplay. These choices affect the outcome of not only the next chapter, but the ending that you'll eventually see. You'll be playing as someone different for each chapter, which kind of reminds me of Phantasy Star 3 on the Genesis. Except that you don't directly choose your bride at the end of the chapter like you do in that game. Still, it makes it more interesting than it would have been otherwise, and it adds a lot of replay value to the game. There are five chapters in this game, and they last around an hour each, so it's not a huge time vampire unless you want to see all of the endings. And even if you do, it still doesn't overstay its welcome. The graphics are not fantastic and use rather simple polygon models and the textures aren't anything special. But you get used to it pretty quickly and it's certainly not a bother. The only thing that did kind of bother me was how slowly one scene fades out and the next one fades in, especially when you're going back and forth. Again, it's not something that should turn anyone away from playing the game, but if I'm gonna nitpick about something, well, it's gonna be that. The music is usually pretty good and adds to the overall enjoyment of your quest. This isn't a game that gets a lot of discussion in most communities, and I think you should definitely try it if you can. It's a well-playing game with some decent ideas and the multiple storylines only enhance it. It's also certainly not the best game in the world or anything like that, but it's definitely not a waste of your time by any means. Like I said, try it. This one's called Worm, Journey to the Center of the Earth, and it's on the NES from Asmic. Your goal in this game is to get to the center of the Earth, and the gameplay chronicles this journey. This one has many different styles of play. You start out in a ground-based drill thing that will let you plow through certain types of rock. You can also enable the change mode, which allows you to float and also drill at the same time. In both modes, you can of course shoot. You have a fuel meter and a life meter. When you get hit, your life meter drains, but it refills automatically as long as you're not continuously getting hit. You'll have to grab power-ups to restore your fuel. As you collect more crew, you'll gain access to newer and better weapons to use in these segments. Eventually, you'll get to a spot where you need to have a bit of dialogue amongst the characters that are inside of the vehicle. Then, you fight a battle in first-person mode. These are kind of weird because in order to win, you need to raise the possibility to 100%. Once you do that, the next hit kills whatever it is that you're fighting. Sometimes shooting and hitting the monster will raise your possibility score. Other times, having conversations with your crew can raise or even lower your possibility. Like I said, it's pretty weird. You only have a life meter here and it doesn't regenerate, so you need to be careful. There's no fuel to worry about in this mode. Then you'll get out of your ship and be on foot as the green-haired girl. She can jump and shoot. If you press up on the D-pad, she can also kick. Here you have an arms and a life meter. Arms is your gun and it can run out quickly and your life doesn't regenerate here either. Sometimes if you're lucky, a defeated enemy will drop an icon that will partially refill your arm or your life meter. These areas can be really tricky and maze-like. You need to fall down certain holes in the correct order or you'll just wind up at a dead end again and again. Sometimes you'll make it to what appears to be a boss, but you don't need to kill them. Seriously, you can just walk right past to the edge of the screen and that's all the game needs from you. Lastly, there's an overhead shooter part that happens sometimes. The same fuel and life meter rules as the side view part apply here. Between each segment are small cutscenes that play out, telling a slightly confusing story. The green-haired girl really wants to find Ziggy. Ziggy? I don't blame her. Ziggy is freaking awesome! Are any of the modes here exceptional? No, but they aren't bad at all for their time. The fact that this 8-bit game attempts so many different playstyles is honestly kind of impressive. It's refreshing to switch things up, even if it can be kind of wonky here and there. 
The game isn't overly long with only five acts, as the game calls them, but figuring out some of these mazes might take you a bit. The game comes with a password feature that will start you back at the beginning of the act. You also have unlimited continues that will start you back at the segment you died on. That's good because you only have one life. The graphics are only slightly above average for the console. The occasional animation in the cutscenes is probably the most impressive thing about the visuals. The music is decent, but there's not a huge variety of it. Overall, you should check out Worm. You hardly ever hear about it, and it's absolutely worth trying out. I rented this Nest game not long after it came out, and I had a lot of fun with it that weekend. I eventually bought it, but, you know, like so many games, it became shelf fodder and I didn't really play it very much. I don't know why, but recently I picked it up and played through it, and, you know, it's a good game for what it is. Check it out. This is Cyborg Hunter for the Sega Master System. It was programmed by Sega themselves, but in North America it was released by Activision in a black box which might make you think it's an early Genesis game. Well, it's definitely not. You play as a cyborg who's hunting other cyborgs. You can attack and jump. In fact, this game uses every single button on the Master System controller so only big-brained people with lots of dexterity need apply. Holy crap, just look at all those buttons. Actually, you need to have a second controller plugged in to play this one properly. Pressing either button on controller 2 will allow you to access your inventory screen. You'll need to do this a lot, which is likely why they didn't relegate this function to the pause button on the console itself. <laughs> silly Sega not putting a start button on their controller. Still, keep in mind that you can't even get past stage 2 without a second controller, much less finish the game. Looking at the game screen, the lower half is the action portion where you run and fight enemies. You have a regular punch, and you can even select a psycho punch right from the get-go. This fires a powerful projectile, but it uses power every time you fire it. The upper left quadrant is sort of a 3D map. Here, you'll see enemies approaching. Normal enemies are red, and the tougher ones are white. I would have flipped those two colors around, but what do I know? The tougher enemies also sound an alarm as you approach them. You need to defeat all of the tougher enemies in an area before you're allowed to leave. The upper right quadrant is your map, which is pretty self-explanatory. It doesn't show you where anything specific is located other than the elevators which you'll need to get to each floor. Scattered about are icons that will recharge your psycho power as well as your life. The normal enemies respawn if you enter an elevator and exit, but the tougher enemies won't. Life and psycho power refills will also respawn, and that's another thing you want to keep in mind. You need to grab specific items in each stage, like more powerful weapons, shields, and a jetpack. These will help you navigate the upper levels. Sometimes you even have to fight a boss. If you can win these fearsome battles, you'll get an ID card to access the next area. I do take issue with some of the claims on the back of the box. Non-stop enemies, non-stop explosive combat! Warp speed elevators! It may not be as intense as the box would have you believe, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's not enjoyable. This game definitely takes getting used to, but once you do, it's really fun. It may frustrate those who play it for the first time, but once you understand it, finishing the game is actually pretty easy. The graphics are fairly plain, as the game's memory isn't very large. In Japan, this one was based on a licensed property, and it has anime characters and whatnot. For the North American version, your contact is a lady who's dressed like she's going out to a fancy dinner. The music is pretty good, though. This game supports FM sound. Both the PSG and FM sound good for what they are, and honestly, I go back and forth on which one I prefer. Today, it's the FM. There is a game-breaking bug in here that you'll need to watch out for. When you defeat a fearsome boss, they drop an ID card. And, for some reason, you can destroy the ID card. 
If you do, you can't leave the room, and there's literally nothing you can do except reset the game, so be careful. All in all, this game is quite fun, and hardly anyone ever mentions it. Also, PP! -P. Yes, mentally, I'm a child. Try it out. There's no reason that you can't play Sega Master System games in this day and age. Final Fight 3 from Capcom for the Super Nintendo doesn't get a whole lot of attention. I think most people who have played it know it's a pretty good game, but even those people don't seem to bring it up very often. Of course, almost everybody knows the original Final Fight was an early game for the console. This conversion from the arcade only let you choose Hagger and Cody. Guy was nowhere to be seen, and there were tons of other cuts to the game. Most notably, the game was now single player only. The next year, Final Fight Guy was released in Japan and in North America two years after that, initially as a blockbuster exclusive. Here you could choose between Hagger as well as Guy who was missing from the first release. Now Cody is gone. The game still retains most of the cuts as well as the lack of a two-player option. Things started looking up when Final Fight 2 was released though. Sadly, only Hagger returns from the original game. But finally, we get the ability to play with two players simultaneously in a Final Fight game on the Super NES. Overall, it's not a bad game. But I'm here to talk about Final Fight 3, which I feel is much better than Final Fight 2. This time you can choose from four, four different characters, and Cody is the only one missing from the original game. I'm guessing he's probably in jail. The game runs at a rather brisk speed, and the control has also been refined to match it. What's really nice is that there are a lot more moves you can do here. Obviously, you can attack and jump. You can also pick up weapons as you'd expect, and many of them here are pretty fun to use. Like the first two games, as well as most other beat-em-ups, you have a special attack that'll hit enemies all around you when you're surrounded. If this attack touches an enemy, you'll lose a bit of life from your life bar. But what sets this one apart are the extra moves that you can do that I mentioned. You can do basic Street Fighter motions on the D-pad for cooler attacks. You can also run by double-tapping a direction and even do dashing attacks. This all helps the game feel much more lively. Oh, and we can't forget about the super gauge that fills up as you smack the enemies around. Once this is full, you can do a super attack which does quite a bit of damage. If you don't use it, it will eventually reset to the beginning and start to charge up again. Of course, this one retains the two-player co-op from Final Fight 2, and it works decently well. But if you don't have any friends, the Super Nintendo itself is there for you if you choose the Auto 2P Play mode. Here, the Super Nintendo controls the Player 2 character, and you both fight your way through the game just like there's another person sitting on the couch next to you. The Super NES will always be there for you as a friend, and never say no to a co-op game of Final Fight 3. Anyway, it has its own stock of lives, and be careful because you can't hurt each other. The Super Nintendo does a decent job as Player 2, but sometimes there just aren't enough enemies for both players as only three are ever on screen at once. And if you haven't noticed, it comes with quite a bit of slowdown as well. The graphics look pretty good, though nothing here is absolutely mind-blowing. That's okay, though. The game is severely letterboxed, as many titles on the console tend to be. The sound and music are both pretty good, though each musical selection plays in many different scenes throughout the game. The good news is that this one isn't absolutely drenched in unnecessary reverb like Final Fight 2 was. <laughs> This is a great title, and honestly, it's the best Final Fight game on the platform. It may not be Streets of Rage, but that doesn't mean it's not a great game that deserves to be in any beat-em-up fan's collection.
And there you go, more games that I feel people should give a first or even a second look. Now, these games are not AAA titles, nor do they need to be. So many good games get overlooked because everyone wants to focus on the big names that already get plenty of attention. So let me know what games need more love, modern or retro, it doesn't matter. Like I said, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. You ever play Virtual Racing Deluxe on the Sega 32X? Yeah, it's, it's a good game, but the box is kind of boring. Even the back of the box is, I mean, it serves its purpose, but it's, you know, a little generic. It's run of the mill. But have you ever played the Japanese version called VR Virtual Racing Deluxe for the Super 32X? That's right. I think the box art is a lot more lively. What do you think? And the back of the box is a lot better too. In fact, it says right here in big green text that the graphics are comparable or even comparable to the arcade, but the fun goes even beyond the arcade. That is a bold statement. It also says down here that Terra Drive owners, the uh, Pioneer Laser Active owners, the Mega Jet owners, and the, and the Iowa thing, well, those owners can go straight to hell because you can't play VR Virtual Racing Deluxe. But the best thing about the back of the box, it's the ladies. Oh man, that's hot.